Uh, enough rambling for me. Um, so I want to introduce uh, the real content now. Our first keynote today uh, is building sustainable security programs. Um, Asta Singhal is currently a director of security at Netflix, uh, leading teams responsible for securing Netflix's workforce and product technology footprint in support of the product, studio, and enterprise. Prior to this, she was a product uh, security leader leading security for the Salesforce App Exchange and other core products. She is passionate about proactive security by design, scalable security programs, and inclusion in the security community. Without further ado, welcome to the stage, Asta. All right, very good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Asta. As Reed said, I lead workforce and infrastructure security at Netflix. And Besides is one of my favorite conferences in the world, so I'm really, really excited to be up here today. And today we are going to talk about building sustainable security programs. Okay, you may be tired of talking about information security burnout because, you know, it's a topic that we've all been talking about a lot. Maybe more so than we ever have before, uh, especially after two years of the pandemic and counting. Thank you everyone for wearing your masks, by the way. Um, and in the pandemic, where it's been difficult to just be a human, let alone be a human in a job where you just never win. And of course, there is no shortage of literature on burnout in the InfoSec industry and all the underlying reasons that go into it. But um, today, the topic I want to talk to all of you about is the ways in which factors that contribute to the pressure and stress that we feel as security professionals and changes that security leaders can be making to their organizational culture, to their risk perspective, program strategy and alignment with their stakeholders that would help improve the sustainability and well-being of their teams. Okay, so why don't we jump right in? We will start from talking about the contributing factors that play into this. Often in InfoSec, we're in firefighting mode a lot. There's always another open vulnerability that we have to go chase down another feature threat model that needs to get done, another SaaS security review, another Java vulnerability that has to be patched across your whole fleet. We can just never catch up. And being in this heightened state of stress and constantly reacting to things, it's exhausting. And when you're in this mode, yes, you may be keeping busy all the time, but you aren't always being effective at addressing the root cause or even making the highest quality decisions all the time. And as we all know, security people, we care a lot. In fact, sometimes we care a little bit too much. And if you have spent any amount of time in InfoSec, you've been disappointed. You've been disappointed by the decisions that were made by your stakeholders, You've been disappointed by the state of things, the bugs that got shipped to production, the intense back and forth with a product team that still led to a risk exception. And because of all of that disappointment, we sometimes tend to give up a little bit. We tend to assume the worst of our partners, of our customer teams, of our stakeholders, of our leadership. It's almost like we've earned our cynicism. We think, oh, I know how bad this thing is if everybody else cared as much as I do. But of course, that never happens. So it's so easy to become jaded by the state of things. I definitely remember a number of times walking away from stakeholder meetings and just feeling annoyed. And when you're in the business of preventing bad outcomes, and you're constantly surrounded by all of the things that can be going wrong, and there is a high impact of that thing going wrong, then it becomes easy to catastrophize everything. We get so focused on the impact of what's possible that we forget to consider what's probable. And it's easy to assume that the worst case scenario, it's bound to happen. It's gonna happen this year, it's gonna happen this week, this month, it, there's no denying it. We're just waiting for the other shoe to drop. 
And our community is full of really passionate people that truly enjoy this field and information security. We really care about the work, and we put a lot of ourselves into that work. And for most of us, this translates into feeling like our job is to prevent every bad thing from happening, and there is enormous personal responsibility that we all carry around with that. And because there's a sense of personal failure there. And when you couple that with the fact that your customer teams or your leadership don't really understand what to expect from their security program, that is what they think, right? We have a security team, so nothing bad can ever happen. I want you to take a second and think about how ridiculous and impossible this expectation is that we've just made our normal and then we just walk around and live our life and we're like, yeah, that's the, I'm ready to carry around that pressure every single day. And more often than not, there is tension and conflict between the security team and your stakeholders. You're always convincing someone to fix that bug, to prioritize deprecating that one legacy service that has all those security holes, or you're escalating risk exceptions in product features that are going out the door, or you're denying that SaaS vendor request that the marketing team has to use. And of course, there is supposed to be some healthy tension there, but being in this state of constant conflict with your customers and stakeholders, it weighs on you. It's hard. And the changing threat landscape doesn't help either. There are new emerging threats all the time that may impact your posture. What was good enough yesterday may not be so today. Maybe you weren't thinking so much about ransomware a year ago or software supply chain issues a couple of years ago. But now, it's all you can talk about, and the vendors won't stop calling you about it. And now you have to go back to the drawing board and figure out all of the assumptions in your program that you ha have to now go revisit. And after all of that, no matter how hard we try, we're never really done. It's not like one fine day, we'll all wake up and say, OK, we're all good. We've secured all the things forever. We can all just go home. No. We can never make progress fast enough. And there are never enough things in the wins column. There are always more broken things to fix. In fact, there isn't that much we can point to as, oh, I did the thing, that's the win, right? Only one thing has to go wrong to result in a bad outcome. OK, so I just want to acknowledge that that was a lot. And that is the reality of our community and our profession today. I have personally struggled with a lot of these things, and I know folks in my community that have. In fact, when I was doing a dry run of this talk with my team, they're like, this is too depressing. I was like, this is our lives. <laughs> but the good news is that we do have the ability to change this status quo. So why don't we talk about that? The first thing that I really want us to focus on is how the culture of our security organization impacts the sustainability of our teams. We talked about how easy it can be to become jaded and be cynical about the state of, state of things. But the problem with this individual cynicism is that before you know it, that becomes the culture of your team. And that can be really, really harmful in your ability to show up for your customers. Because you can't be objective about the perspective that they're bringing to the table. You don't trust their intentions. You don't trust their judgment. And you can't show up as a collaborative partner because you assume the worst. So as leaders, it is our job to actively disrupt this kind of mindset on our teams. So the next time someone on your team is frustrated because some team is not fixing a security issue, help them contextualize the security work in the broader context of the business goals. It's entirely possible that the security work is not the most important thing that needs to happen for a particular launch. Guide them to find the ways in which there is commonality between the security team's goals and the business goals. Help them to understand the customer team's intent and work towards a compromise that may still mitigate the risk that you're worried about. 
And the other way in which we as leaders impact the culture of our organizations is through hiring. So when it comes to hiring for your teams, you need to be thinking about skills like customer enablement, collaboration, stakeholder management, as much as you think about technical competencies for a particular role, maybe more so. Because these skills are really, really important in working collaboratively to solve problems with our stakeholders and to build a healthy team culture. And this jaded mindset of like, oh man, everything's broken, or developers, they just don't care about security, that should be a red flag. We need to be paying attention to these types of things when we are building out our organizations. I came across this comic in a blog post that Ryan Nakamoto wrote about heroics culture. Now, of course, the idea of the person that saves the day, it's really appealing. Who doesn't want to be a superhero? I would much prefer to be Wonder Woman. But the fact that you need heroics to save the day means that you failed earlier on somewhere. And the problem with the heroics is that it's not sustainable, it's exhausting if you have to put on that cape constantly. I'm not saying that incident response and firefighting is not important, but what's also important is making the proactive long-term investments that would reduce the need for as much incident response, it would focus on scalability, sustainability, and it's no surprise that you incentivize more of the behavior that you reward on your teams. And of course, when somebody goes above and beyond, you wanna recognize their efforts, the hard work and the impact that they're having, but we also need to get better at digging deeper and understanding why there is heroics going on on your teams. Can you understand the root causes that are at play here that make the heroics necessary? And can you solve for that instead? As an example, if you run any Java in your ecosystem, you probably remember your log4j response from a few months ago. I know I do. Um, and my team, you know, for that response, we made stickers and swag for everyone that participated because you know, we like to do stickers and swag. Um, but it was great. It was good to recognize all of the hard work that went into that. But at the same time, when we were conducting our retros, we also focused on the success of the long-term investments that made that response possible and efficient. So things like ecosystem visibility, things like our well management tooling, all of these things are important for us to be able to do incident response efficiently. And as part of those retros, we also tried to identify areas where there may be a single point of failure or areas where we needed more run books or better ownership because those are the things that will enable our long-term success. So when you conduct incident retros, make room for understanding the factors that impact the sustainability. Recognize the painstaking long-term work that creates an impact. Celebrate the work that prevents the need for heroics altogether. Culture, it takes intentionality. It doesn't just happen. So setting this tone for sustainability and long-term thinking will foster a culture on your team that values it. So this idea of additive teams really resonates for me, and I wanted to share it with you all. It focuses on the need to assess your current strengths and gaps as a team to determine what you need to be hiring for so you can add to your existing perspectives and skill sets. So think about the competencies that your team currently has, the feedback that you receive from your partners and customers, the opportunities that you aren't quite able to realize yet, and map that into the needs for the next person that you need to hire on your team. Maybe you have a lot of technical security competencies on your team, but you aren't able to improve the product experience of the, the products that you're building for your customers. 
or maybe you're missing program management skills to take things to 100% and actually realize the risk reduction impact. Or maybe you have folks who can help assess the severity of a vulnerability, but maybe you're missing the engineering chops for being able to do things like automated pull requests that would uh, make the remediation process even easier for engineers. This introspection about your strengths and gaps can really help build team trust, increase self-awareness, and help folks be more thoughtful about, okay, what are we missing, and really help them appreciate the skills that they need on their teams. As an example, at one point, my team was largely AppSec experts, and they were all really great at what they did, you know, finding vulnerabilities, security architecture, all of that good stuff. But we were not going to scale our program with just AppSec-focused work. So we grew our team to bring product-focused security ICs, to bring program managers, software engineers, infrastructure security engineers, because we needed all of those things to achieve our long-term mission of being able to build a scalable application security program. And thinking about team composition in this way can create an environment in which folks can bring that new perspective to the table, and they can be really deeply energized by the outcomes they're able to achieve with each other and what they can learn from each other. And it also reduces the commiseration and pessimism of the battle scars that all of your security people may share. And trust me, I think your security people could use the optimism. And it gives you the opportunity to bring new ideas that can help solve some of these age-old problems that we may have given up on a little bit and we need new ways to think about them. When it comes to building an empathetic team culture, team leaders are the ones who really need to take initiative. You set the tone for what that looks like on your team. You sit in a position of privilege where showing up with vulnerability may be easier for you than most folks on your team. But this vulnerability can be really powerful for your team culture, and it can lead to really meaningful connections. This job, as we all know, it can sometimes take an emotional toll on you. And having an environment of vulnerability and honesty can really help folks feel less alone. It allows folks to find community with their peers. And it's beyond simply being able to collaborate on the work that they're doing. It's about being able to build connections, have the support structures in place that would allow you to navigate difficult topics and relationships with customers, and even help each other recognize and celebrate the wins. A few months ago, one of my teams decided to spin up a forum um, to really discuss how they work, because they wanted to learn from the techniques that each of them are applying to kind of like their own area of work. And sure, they got to do that in that forum, but it also ended up being a really supportive space for them to share their challenges and to support each other because they had built that trust and that environment of empathy and vulnerability, and they were able to feel seen and heard with their peers and do their best work. And such environments can also help us get through those difficult days when you just can't seem to win. The criticality of the security work that you do, it may vary based on the business that you're in. For example, human safety will always be more important than, say, credit card information. But no matter what your business is, one thing that's mostly true is that security teams exist to enable the business. Now, of course, our job is to manage the risk for the company, but at the end of the day, if the company was to go out of business, then we wouldn't need to be here. It's really important for security teams to internalize this mindset of business enablement because this helps us think of ourselves as a department that's invested in the success of the stakeholders that we're supporting. We're not here to do our own security thing in a corner. 
And we are here to be a part of the success of the business that we support, and it doesn't have to be so isolating. In fact, I would urge you to go one step further and think about what would it mean for you to be a customer-focused security team? Can you provide services and products that your stakeholders are truly delighted by? And I'm not saying that we have to stop advocating for the right things for security, and then we just give up all our influence and we just do what the product managers say. No, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is we really think about those security outcomes with influence and building a track record of a security team that people truly enjoy working with. In that world, I think it also makes you think more about what are the security experiences that aren't as usable, that people are trying to avoid, and you can focus your energy on improving that. For example, if there is a cumbersome manual review process that folks are less than thrilled to go through, what can you do to reduce the number of steps in it? Can you automate more of it? Can you make it more secure by default? Think about ways in which you can build customer focus into your security team culture. The second area of focus that I want to talk about is building a risk-focused perspective. Now, hopefully we can all agree that a security team's job is to manage and reduce risk. So what is risk? Risk is likelihood times impact. The total amount of risk exposure is the probability of a bad event occurring multiplied by the potential impact of that event. But I actually think security engineers were really bad at risk. We get hyper-focused on impact and we forget to consider likelihood, which is why everything is always doom and gloom. And to be better at our jobs of managing risk, we need to build a better perspective on how we think about risk, uh, risk impact. So thinking about probability and not just the impact of an event. Uh, Ryan McGeehan, who some of you may know as Magoo, has done some great work on helping engineers understand and speak risk. I highly recommend you check it out. I will leave the link in my slides that'll be shared afterwards. And this idea of risk forecasting and quantification, it can really help us think about it in more concrete and time-boxed ways. And it helps us move away from preventing all bad outcomes to reducing the probability of the bad outcomes. It helps security engineers be more realistic about risk and the ways that we can mitigate it. Now, I wanna acknowledge that this is hard and it's imperfect, but it's imperfect in the same ways that what we are doing now is imperfect. So I think it's worth the effort to evolve how we think about risk. Security teams, we also need to build a clear understanding of the threat model that our business is operating in. And this should actively guide how you invest in your program. Let's be honest, not all companies out there are protecting against nation state actors. So you need to know what are your critical assets, who are your threat actors, and what are their motivations. This can help you be more measured and deliberate with your security program. And understanding why security matters to the business can really help contextualize your program in the broader picture. Now, based on the threat model that you operate in, your security team may have a certain level of authority to be able to say no to things, or maybe you don't have very much authority at all. You're expected to operate with influence and advocacy. No matter your situation, I would strongly urge you to operate with the principle of holding yourselves accountable to a high standard on what is the security guidance that you're providing and making sure that it aligns with the risk perspective of your organization. If someone was to show up at your door tomorrow and ask you, explain to me how this decision was made, what is the impact on the company, 
why, what is the assumptions on which we're operating, we should be able to be transparent about that. So we need to put a lot of rigor into the security decisions that we make for our stakeholders. Be more pragmatic and transparent with your guidance. This will not only help your security teams be more thoughtful and pragmatic, but it'll also improve the experience of your customers. Okay, so hopefully we can all agree that we are never going to do all the things, but there is a lot of things that need to get done every day. So having a strategic program focus is really important for sustainability and scalability of your program and your teams. Now, there's obviously a lot of important operational services that a security program provides to the company. Uh, individual threat models, feature reviews, incident response, wall management, all of that fun stuff. But sometimes it can be really easy to get lost in that operations and lose focus of the strategic investments that would enable your long-term success. So once you have a clear idea of the needs of your organization, it's really important to find the right balance between spending your time supporting that day-to-day -day operational work versus investing in that long-term strategic work that lets you get out of the day-to-day. So if your AppSec team is spending most of their time doing security reviews, they may not have the bandwidth to really think about, oh, is there a way for me to make certain baseline controls just default across the board? But you can't make those investments if you're always just in the operations and don't have the bandwidth to look up from the day to day. You can't patch the boat if you're always just bailing water. As security leaders, we have to get better at recognizing these patterns on our teams and make room for them to invest the time in the long-term strategic work that would get us out of the day-to-day -day operations or streamline it over time. In addition to this, we also need to get better at clearly articulating what are the overall goals of our program and what should our teams be doing to get there. For example, is your goal to prevent most bugs from getting to production? Is your goal to get everything fixed within a certain SLA? Is your goal to just have baseline security guarantees and good observability across your fleet? It's important to be clear about those focus areas to your teams because this would allow them to make day-to-day -day decisions that are really in line with the assumptions of kind of what are you here trying to achieve? The answer can't be we're here to secure all the things because that's just not reasonable. It's never going to happen. Because we can never do all the things. And I think that's true no matter how well-funded your security program is. I'm sure you go to you know, the largest security team in the Bay Area and they will still tell you that they don't have enough funding. And it's important to set those strategic goals that are in line with your threat model and you know, how much investment you're able to make in your security program so that your teams can make those thoughtful and measured decisions every day. One tool that we use for this at Netflix that I really like is this idea of strategy bets. So strategy bets are basically informed judgment calls on what what are the bets we're making about our program? These things need to be tested, debated, and altered over time. So it's not a 100% obvious choice, but it's one of the two possible routes that we can take. And this idea of taking one of those possible routes, it allows us to be deliberate about not choosing that other route and investing our energy into that. So for example, our security team has chosen to focus on this idea of leaning into the paved roads and securing those central points of leverage. Now, the other option there is to go meet the uh, customer teams where they are and secure every possible technology option. I think that is also a valid path, but we have chosen that not to be the one that we are investing our time in. And knowing this, 
everyone in the organization is able to be really deliberate about the investments that they make day to day and be confident that that's aligned with the overall org strategy. Another area on program strategy to think about is where can you find leverage points and efficiency in your program? And sometimes that may even be outside the security team. Some of you may have heard me previously talk about this idea of hitching the security wagon to developer productivity, which talks about finding ways to scale security through developer tools and experiences. Some of my colleagues in information security and cloud gateway published a blog post last year on how we did this to productize certain security controls through our authentication proxy. So in that case, we approached our security checklist with sort of the mindset of, okay, what are the things that are consistent enough across all of these applications that we can easily build into that authentication proxy? So things like the web application firewall, DDoS prevention, security header validation, uh, consistent logging, all of those things fit the bill. And what ended up happening is that this improved sort of the internet facing controls work not just for our team, but for every customer team that wanted to put a new app on the internet. We're now trying to realize similar scalability wins with other parts of our infrastructure as well. And this not only helps scale our program, but it also makes security a true partner to other central teams at the company that we get to work with. Think about how you can create the time and space for such leverage-focused work on your teams. Can you make this specifically a part of your team's charter? Can this be someone's full-time job? Because these types of leverage investments are important in that long-term scalability and sustainability. And in the world where there are a million things to do, thinking about critical data assets that have a real impact on your business can be a strong guiding light on how to invest your time. So instead of closing every possible door and window, could you lock down access to those critical data assets and invest your time in preventing and detecting potential impact to that? Can you find ways to minimize the exposure to those critical data assets Figure out tiering criteria to be able to right size your investment based on data categories. Top risks should always be the context in which you make your investment decision, both for proactive and reactive security controls. And speaking of proactive and reactive security controls, I think there is a reframing here on overall security assurance for your program as opposed to preventative versus reactive work, right? So at the end of the day, there is an opportunity for us to really think about how do those investments complement each other. Let's say you can't roll out comprehensive authorization policies for a new low trust user type in your ecosystem for another three quarters. Could you work with your detection team to put some detections in place that would monitor anomalous activity from that particular identity type? Would that help your security engineers sleep better at night? In fact, you may have areas where your ability to put in proactive controls is just limited altogether. Let's say you can't fully lock down your CI-CD ecosystem because, let's be honest, all your engineers will hate you and it'll be a developer experience that is pretty hellish to work in. Um, so what do you do? Can you put blocking controls in place to detect potential attack scenarios that are fairly common, like attempted packet squats and other CICD type issues. In this way, you can utilize those reactive controls to compensate for the limited proactive controls work while being able to balance the overall security experience of that uh, particular world. And last but not the least is the investments that we should be making in stakeholder and leadership alignment. More often than not, senior leaders do not know what to expect from their security program. And of course, we talk about how, well, it's not their job to know, it's our job. But the problem with that approach where they're not supposed to know what to expect, guess what? 
what they expect is nothing bad can ever happen because we have a security team. And then when it does, we'll just fire the CISO and move on with our lives. Um, and that leads to all of this dysfunction of you know, living up to that impossible expectation of nothing bad can ever happen. So as security leaders, for the sake of our teams, we need to have a meaningful conversation about risk appetite. What are the top risks and what does level of investment in the program mean for your ability to mitigate those risks versus not? Now, we talked a little bit about quantitative risk before. That can be a great tool to make this a dollars to dollar comparison about risk tolerance and security investment. And it will allow you to create clarity on what's important and how can you further improve that story with further investment. Now, I'm not gonna try to explain quantified risk to you because I'm not an expert in this space and I'm lucky enough to work with people who are experts in this space. Um, I will be linking out their work on risk quantification and a blog post that they wrote about a risk quantification library that we open sourced a few years ago. So the link will be in my slides for that. And in this world, hopefully, you're also able to work towards some shared guiding principles between yourself and your engineering and business counterparts. So let's say if the guiding principle is that you need to prioritize innovation above all else, then maybe the business is able to lean into more security risk and incur the security cost that may come with that. Or if the guiding principle is that you want to aim for a high prevention standard on the security controls, then you can align with your business counterparts and your engineering leadership on what that will mean for velocity or developer experience. Because let's be honest, we're not going to get all the things all at once. You have to make some trade-offs somewhere. And having these shared principles with our counterparts allows us to be thoughtful and aligned on those trade-offs that we need to make. And there can still be a healthy tension with those stakeholders in this world, but at least you won't be disappointed by their decisions as much because you're making them against agreed upon principles, or you won't be in this constant state of conflict and relitigating everything with them all the time. Now, with this idea of having shared principles, clarity on top risks, risk appetite, seems like we're going to a good place, it's also important to create ongoing visibility for the top risks to your stakeholders and to senior leadership. All security teams more or less know the stuff that keeps them up at night. And more often than not, it ties back to the top risk areas for your company. And sometimes this can also be the stuff that that one security engineer who feels a really, really strong sense of personal responsibility carries around with them every day. Oh, that one team, they have that legacy app. Well, hopefully nothing bad happens with it. And when you create this visibility and shared ownership, then the accountability exists along with your stakeholders. The security team's not carrying that around by themselves. They're not worrying about it alone in a corner. And when you have those types of forums, you can utilize them to highlight the shared wins of the program and the ways in which you're able to make progress and improve those relationships as well. And lastly, I cannot overstress the importance for showing up for our customers with reasonable expectations that are in line with your risk appetite in your guiding principles for the program. Don't be the dentist where no matter how hard you try, you always get in trouble. It's like, oh, you brush twice a day? How come you don't floss? Like, no, no, nobody wants that. We need to show up for our customers with reasonable approaches that align with your risk posture. OK, so we covered a lot of ground there. Uh, why don't we do a quick recap for our key takeaways? There are a lot of factors that can go into the lack of sustainability for security teams, ranging from personal cynicism to sense of personal failure to evolving landscape and stakeholder conflict. 
we as security leaders can help improve the sustainability of our teams and our programs by focusing in a few key areas. First and foremost, building a sustainable, empathetic organizational culture in which people feel supported, energized, and excited by their work is really important. You have to disrupt the cynicism. You have to be intentional about team culture. You have to celebrate the wins, and you have to solve for long-term sustainability. It can help build a supportive team environment and make security a team sport. Second, you have to invest in building a thoughtful, pragmatic risk perspective that helps your security team understand why security matters to the business and how they can show up as thoughtful partners to the business. This can help combat the ongoing conflict that we feel with our, with our stakeholders, make security a part of overall business success, and help us get out of that doom and gloom mindset. Third is you have to be very deliberate about the strategic, strategic focus areas of your program. We will never do all the things. We're not superheroes. So as security leaders, it is our responsibility to set up our team in such a way that they have the bandwidth for the strategic long-term investments. There is a clear understanding of the focus areas and the guiding principles of your program that can guide day-to-day -day decisions that they're making and help with measurable, reasonable approaches, stronger cross-functional relationships, and allowing the team to focus on what's really most important. And last but not the least, you have to build strong alignment with your stakeholders and your leadership so you have a shared understanding of risk appetite and the guiding principles that inform your organization. It can help ease the pressure that your security team feels day to day to relitigate expectations and carrying personal responsibility for areas where there may be some reasonable risk acceptance. If we invest in some of these things, we can build sustainable and scalable security programs. That's all I got. Thank you so much. Thank you, Asa, for presenting at Eastside San Francisco. On behalf of the conference and our sponsor, GIF, uh, our, our gift speaker sponsor, Maltigo, we want to present this gift of our appreciation. Thank you again. Is there time for questions? Um, yeah, if there's any... Um, you've got about three minutes. Oh, okay. If you want to Go ahead. So, you divide with your... First of all, for that you divide with your... your Internal stuff for your team and external stuff. How, in your experience, which one is tougher? Like, how do you, is it, how much time do you spend on the internal stuff for your team versus the leadership alignment? I think as senior leaders, oh, sorry, I'll repeat the question. So, how much time do you need to be spending internally with your teams versus externally with your stakeholders and your leadership? I would say for senior leaders of the security organization, your primary job is that external alignment with leadership and stakeholders that allows your teams to execute well against shared principles. Um, so yeah, I think security leaders need to think about how they're spending their time and it needs to be more outwards. All right, thank you very much. Woo!